Sahana Bhavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Sahaviryam Karavavahai Tejasvinavadhi Tamastuma Vidvishavahai Om Shanti 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 Samasta Janakalyani Niratam Karunamaya Namami Chinmayam Devam Satgurum Brahma Vidvaram Om Apyayantu Amangani Vag Pranash Chakshu Shrotramatho Balamindriyani Chasarvani Sarvam Brahmo Panishadam Maham Brahma Nirakuriyat Ma Ma Brahmanira Karod Anira Karanam Astuanira Karanam Me Astu Tadatmani Nirateya Upanishad Sudharma Te Mai Santo Te Mai Santo Om Shanti 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 We'll read the first two verses together. Okay. Kene shitam patati preshitam manaha. Kena prana pratama praiti yuktaha. Kene shitam vachamimam vadanti. Chakshu shrotram ka udevo yunakti. Shrotrasya Shrotram Manaso Manoyata Vacho Havacham Saupranasya Pranaha Chakshushas Chakshurati Muchedhira Pretyas Maloka Damrita Bhavanti. Okay, so we are at Kenopanishad and we have completed the first two mantras. Now the first mantra, the student's question was, by what is it that illumines everything? What is it that illumines this mind? What is it that illumines this mind? What is it that illumines these pranas? And what is it that illumines this very speech? And the eyes and the ears, how, what is that power by which all of these function? What is that power by which all of these function? What is that? That I want to know. Because the student has come to the conclusion that there is something because of which the eyes can see, the ears can hear, the nose can smell, the tongue can taste. There's something because of which all of this can happen. Now, what is that something what is that innermost essence? What is that something? And so the teacher very beautifully, the second mantra says, Shrotrasya Shrotra. It's the ear of the ear. Manaso Manoyat. It's the mind of the mind. Vacho Havacham. It's the speech of the speech. Saupranasya Pranaha. It is that vital air of that vital air or the life of the life. Chakshushas chakshuhu, the eye of the eye. Atimucha dhiraha, and that wise person. Atimucha means atimucha having abandoned or transcended the identification with this body, mind, intellect. Pretyasma lokat, 
pretya means having gone away from this world of senses, of identifying with the senses, body, mind. Amrita bhavanti. They become immortal. So this was the answer of the teacher. And it was such a beautiful answer because the teacher is telling the student, now don't go look for something outside. What's making all of this function? Don't go look for something outside. Look within you. So go to the eye of the eye, the ear of the ear means go inside, go inward. That's the direction to look at. And also by this answer, the teacher is saying, yes, there is something. There is something. And the teacher is also saying that this is so important to know because atimucha diraha, those who have atimucha transcended the identification with the outer, with the eye, the ear, the pranas, those who have transcended that and have departed from this world of senses, they alone become immortal. And this is why it should be known. So not only is the teacher saying, this is the answer to your question, but this should be known. And when we talk about they become immortal, we have clarified that it's not that one becomes immortal, one already realizes that they are ever immortal. There's only this notion. All that exists, all that really exists is a, an erroneous notion that I am this ego who is bound and going through this thing called samsara. That's all that really is there. That, that's the only problem. And that problem is just a notion. It's nothing else. It's nothing else but that notion. The moment that notion has been transcended, has been removed, then one realizes their immortal nature. Immortal nature doesn't mean the body or mind become mortal because it will never do so. But it means that we will realize that we are ever timeless and eternal and beyond time and space. So all that has to be removed is just that notion. That's enough. Actually, nothing more is required in Vedanta. Now, having heard this, the student still seems a little bit puzzled. Right? You're saying the eye of the eye, the ear of the ear, the breath of the breath. What is that? You know, how do the, the, the student is wondering, okay, you're saying the eye of the eye, the ear of the ear, the breath of the breath. How do I get there? How do I get there? You're saying go inward. How do I get there? So the student is wondering, tell me how to get there. So in the next verse, can I see it? It's eye of the eye, can I see it? Natatra chakshur gachati. <laughs> right? The eyes don't go there. Can I, can, you know, can you tell me about it? Can, can I uh, speak about it? Can anybody speak about it? Nava gachati. Speech doesn't go there. Can I know it? Uh, can I know it with my mind? Nope. The mind doesn't go there. And so this forms the next mantra, which we will read. And so the students try to figure out, how do I get there? How do I find this out? And the teacher saying, nope, 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 nothing gets there. So let us see this mantra. Huh? It's very, very beautiful. Um, so I think Padmini Ji, if you can repeat after me, I'll just unmute you. Yeah, okay. Natatra chakshur gachati. Natatra chakshur gachati. Nava gachati. Nava gachati. No manaha. No manaha. Navid maha. Navid maha. Navijani maha. Navijani maha. Yatheta danushishyat. Yatheta danushyat. Yatheta danushishyat. Anya devatat viditat. Anya devatat viditat. Atho avidita adhi. Atho avidita adhi. Iti shushruma purvesham. Iti shushruma purvesham. Yena stadvyacha chakshire. Yena stadvyacha chakshire. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So let's read this together. 
न त्र चक्षुर्गछति न वागछति नो मन न विदम न विजानीम यथैतदनुशिष्यादिताश्रुषुम पूर्व स्तव्याचक्षिरे so what does this mean na na means no never tatra there chakshuhu gachati means the i does not go there na tatra chakshuhu gachati the i doesn't go there na va gachati the speech vak speech vak or vag here means speech na va gachati speech doesn't go there gachati means goes na gachati does not go no manaha the no here means na u so na u manaha gachati neither does the mind go there na vid maha nor do we know how to explain it in such and such manner na vijani maha nor do we know how to yatha etad how it anushishya how it can be instructed the teacher is saying nor do we know how it can be instructed <laughs> so we're all thinking okay then what are we here for then he says anyat eva tad vidita anyat eva it is very distinct tad vidita from the known anya deva tad vidita and then at the same time ataha then avidita adhi it is adhi other than avidita the unknown iti thus shushruma we have heard purvesham from our ancestors ye naha those who to us tad vyacha chakshire those who have taught that to us so how this is translate the i does not go there nor speech nor mind we do not know that we do not know how to instruct one about it it is distinct from the known and above the unknown we have heard it so stated the preceptors who taught us that so when we look at this mantra it's full of contradictions <laughs> full of contradictions okay so let's go one by one first natatra chakshur gachati first the i does not go there now why is it that the i doesn't go there so now in vedanta now this is another definition as what is inert last time we saw what is inert what cannot know itself or something else in vedanta what is inert is what is seen yad drishyam tad jadam so anything that is seen that is called inert hmm? anything that is seen now you might wonder why why is it so anything that we see anything anything that we see we see this body that means it's inert we see this book that means it is inert we see this bottle that means it is inert we see the screen it is inert why do we say it is inert because it requires the seer for it to be experienced that is why it's called inert it requires a sentient seer for it to be experienced so now last time the question was about fire why is fire inert so one way you can look at it is because it requires a seer a sentient experience a sentient being for it to be experienced otherwise fire cannot be experienced how experience happens is this a thought in the mind pervades the object this is what we call vritti vyapti and later on we will also see a little bit more about this vritti vyapti the thought vyapti means pervade vritti pervasion of thought so vyapti pervasion vritti of thought so when the thought pervades an object then only we have experience of the object without the thought pervading the object there is no such experience and therefore that is why we say that these things are inert because they need a sentient being for them to be experienced so whatever is seen 
and seen is uh, we take as upalakshana so seen heard smelt tasted experienced whatever is experienced that is called inert yad drishyam tad jadam what is seen experienced tad jadam that is called inert now so the eyes cannot go there why because the eyes themselves are seen <laughs> The eyes see, but the eyes themselves are seen. And how are the eyes seen? They're seen by the mind. The condition of the eyes, whether it is watery, whether it is dry, whether I can't see so far or I can't, you know, I can only see near. What illumines that? That is called the mind. So therefore, the eyes are also seen. And because the eyes are also seen, they are inert. They require a sentient being for them to be illumined. So the eyes cannot go there. Eyes are inert. Now, it, just think about it. Uh, if the eyes uh, cannot see the mind, how, how, what to talk about consciousness? <laughs> eyes cannot see the mind so what to talk about consciousness of course eyes cannot see consciousness there's no question about it so if somebody is sitting down and meditating and sa says i see i saw light what is that light that's light <laughs> it's not consciousness huh? somebody says i i saw something i had a vision of something what is that that's a vision that's not consciousness. That is not consciousness at all. Even that vision is illumined by consciousness. So yes, it is true that some people have the vision of God, uh, vision of God, but even that is illumined by consciousness. Hmm? So the eyes cannot go there. And you know, we innately know this. We innately know this because when we go to a temple, we take up a pilgrimage and we go to a temple far, far away. And, you know, we, we travel to do so many things, so much tapasya we do, especially if we go to Tirupati or something like that. We have to fall in such long lines. Or Vaishno Devi also have to climb so many steps to go there. But when you see that form, that image of God or goddess, and we're only around 30 seconds, by the way, <laughs> when we see that image of God or goddess, what do we do? We close our eyes. Isn't it? We went all that way, we traveled all that way, we formed lines, we did so much tapas here to come in front of that image. But when we looked at that image, what did we do? We just closed our eyes. And this is true not only for a temple, but for a church, for a mosque, for a synagogue, for any place of worship. We get there and all we just wanna do is close our eyes. So innately, even by the actions that we do, we know that God is within. So natatra chakshur gachati means the eyes cannot see the self. The eyes cannot go there. So if I have seen something, it is not Brahman. It is not that pure self. Hmm? Navag gachati. Now speech cannot go there. What do we mean? Speech cannot go there. Because it is that which illumines speech, right? Speech, uh, is, uh, speech comes through our organ of action, our mouth. What illumines that mouth? That is called Brahman. So any word that we have, and we saw this in Panchadashi, the first chapter, that words can only describe certain things. Words can describe a jati. Jati means a particular species. Oh, this is human species, animal species. This is, you know, plant species. Words can describe guna, qualities. This is blue, green, tall, short, dry, wet. Words can describe kriya, an action. Cooking, cleaning, listening, watching. They can describe action. 
words can describe also some banda, a relationship, that this is this person's sister, this person's brother, this person's mother, father. This is how words work. They describe these things. They describe species or qualities or actions or relationships. But when it comes to Brahman, what, what does it have? Right? What does Brahman have a species? No, there's no Brahman species and human species because there is only Brahman. There's nothing else. There is only Brahman. There's no other species to talk about. Does Brahman have any such attributes? No, Brahman has no such attributes. It's nirguna. Does Brahman have any such uh, actions that we can, we can say, well, Brahman is a cook or Brahman is a teacher or Brahman is a human? Or there is no such thing. Brahman is nishkriya. Can we say Brahman is a, you know, a father or the mother of the universe? No, Brahman is not. That's Ishvara. There is no sambandha. Brahman is a sangha, untouched, no relationship, no sangha. So there is, we cannot describe Brahman. Words cannot reach Brahman. In fact, in the Taitriya Upanishad, it says, the words tried to go to touch Brahman, but it couldn't, so it came back. Hmm? So, Bhag Nagachati, speech cannot describe Brahman. Now we come to the mind. The mind doesn't go there. Oh, what do you mean the mind doesn't go there? Well, how will the, can the mind think of Brahman? No, the mind cannot think think of Brahman because the mind exists in what we call time, space, and object limitation. The mind, the minute the mind is there, there's a limitation of time. There's a limitation of space. And there's a limitation of object also. The mind and object, they come together. The, whether the object is an actual object or whether it's blankness it comes together. So the minute we have mind, we have time, we have space, we have object. Whether that object is object object, gross object, subtle object, or blankness object. Like what we saw in Panchadeshi, waking, dream, deep sleep. The moment we have a mind, we have all of that. We have all limitations attached to the mind. So now how will that limited mind reach the unlimited Brahman? How is that possible? It cannot. So even that mind is limited. It cannot go towards Brahman. So, natatra chakshur gachati. Eyes cannot see Brahman, that consciousness. Navag gachati. Nor can speech go to that Brahman. No mana. Nor can that mind go to Brahman. Now somebody might ask, what about the intellect? You know, sometimes we intellectualize Brahman. We intellectualize Brahman. We try to say, okay, this is what it could be. Is it Anu? Is it atomical? Or is it medium size? Or is it Mahan? Is it an all-pervading size? Is it inert? Is it sentient? Is it only in some beings, not all beings? all kinds of concepts we try to place upon Brahman. But Brahman is not that. Brahman is the very illuminator of that intellect. So how can the intellect even go there? It's like this. Uh, just think about the computer, okay? Think about the computer. Now there is electricity. There's electricity and there's a wire and then there's a computer. And when we use the computer, we experience a lot of images, and sounds, and uh, film, and you know all these kinds of things. Now, imagine everything depends on that electricity, right? Everything depends on that electricity. But can the wire know that electricity? Can the wire know that electricity? No. And the wire cannot 
illumine electricity need not illumine electricity because electricity is self-luminous. So in the same way, the electricity is Atman, but the self, Brahman, the wire is like the mind. The wire is the mind. And then the computer is, let's say, the eyes or the sense organs. And the objects in the computer are the sense objects. So you have Atman, the electricity, the wire, which is like the mind, computer, which is the sense organs, and the things in the computer, sense objects. Now, in this, the way that we do not need the wire to illumine electricity, and the wire definitely cannot illumine electricity. It's a conductor of electricity, but it cannot illumine electricity. The same way the mind cannot illumine the self and need not illumine the self. And therefore, na, ma, no manaha. Mind cannot go there. Na, vid, na, na manaha, and even the intellect cannot go there. Mind, intellect cannot go there. Now, some might say, but where does knowledge come into play, right? This will, maybe we'll take this up with the Anya Deva Tadvidita. I'll, I'll hold that thought and we'll take that up. Anya Deva Tadvidita. So the eyes can't go there, speech cannot go there, mind, intellect cannot go there. And he says, Navid Maha. Navid Maha means we do not know Brahman in this, in a particular way. We do not know of Brahman in a particular way with attributes, with action, with color, with size, with all of these things, with relation. We do not know of Brahman in a particular way. And we do not know how to teach Brahman. <laughs> he says we do not know how to teach Brahman. What do you mean we do not know how to teach Brahman? means it's not something that the teacher can actually bring in front of us. It's not something that the teacher can say, yeah, this is Brahman. It is something that the student has to realize by themselves. The teacher can only indicate, like what we saw last time, the Shaka Chandra Nyaya. The teacher can only indicate when the student has to get it. it it's not something that the teacher can uh, give to the student. Hmm? So we do not know, he says, we do not know how to teach it. But, so, Navijani Maha Yatheta Danushishya, that you have to take together. We don't know how it can be taught. But there's a way it can be taught. <laughs> we don't know how it can be taught, but yet there's a way it can be taught. Means we cannot bring it to you, we cannot give it to you, we cannot make you do it, we can indicate it. That's the only thing we can do. And this is how we indicate it. And this is a very beautiful line. Anyad eva tad viditat. Just ato aviditat adi. This much is enough. This much is really enough. It says it's other than the known. And it's different or beyond the unknown. This is called Brahman. So if ever I want to know what Brahman is, it's other than the known and beyond the unknown. Now, let's look at a few things here first. What does this mean to say? So when we say, it is other than the known. Why is it other than the known? Anyat eva tan viditat. It is other than the known because it is the knower. It's the knower, so it cannot be the known. Anything that is known is not Brahman. So now follow this formula. Hmm? What is known? What is experienced? Yad drishya. So drishya. What is known, what is experienced, what is seen. Tad jaram. That is inert. Right? 
So the minute we say something is known or experienced, it becomes inert. So if I know Brahman, then it's inert. <laughs> hmm? If I can think of Brahman, if I can see Brahman, if I can experience Brahman, it becomes inert. So yadrisham tajjata. Next. Now, what is inert, that itself is nashwara. Nashwara means it is destructible. Why is it destructible? What is inert is destructible because when my mind or when that thought of it is not there, it's not there. So uh, an example of this book. Because my thought pervades this book, I have the experience of it. But, so this book is inert. But when I do not pervade this book, when the thought does not pervade this book, then I don't have that experience. So the experience of this book is nashwaram, is destructible. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not there. The experience of the book is impermanent. It's destructible. And if it's destructible, so yad drishyam tad jadam, yad jadam tan nashwaram, yad nashwaram tan mithya, that which is destructible, that is false. That's what we call false. Because remember, what is truth? Truth is that which is always there as it is in all three periods of time. In fact, truth is that which is beyond time truth is that which is beyond space so that is mithya it's mithya it's it's false because it's not there all the time and it's false because it also dependently exists on me the seer and therefore tan mithya tadasat that cannot be reality it cannot be reality from the ultimate standpoint, it cannot be reality. It's asat. <clears throat> Why do we say asat? Because mithya, you know, we still say that it dependently exists on the seer. Uh, the scene dependently exists in the seer. This is what we call mithya. Asat means that th there's only seer. Uh, and in fact, when there's only seer, the, you cannot call it seer. There is just seeing being that's it that's called tad asat it uh, in mandukya upanishad that is called ajatavada uh, i don't want to go there so much but that is called ajatavada uh, so from what we call drishti srishti vada it comes to ajatavada i'll pause for a moment uh, is the screen freezing are you all experiencing that i got that on chat no okay so I think uh, Sudhaji, if you can please see, maybe you can log off and come back. Maybe that will help. So that, that is the reason why it is different from the known. It's different from the known because what is known is inert. What is inert then is destructible. What is destructible is false. And what is false is it's not real. It's not reality, not absolute reality. So if we say Atma is known, then what happens? <laughs> Atma becomes destructible. <laughs> the self becomes destructible. The self becomes false. The self becomes unreal. And all the Shruti quotations, all of everything, our whole Shastra, it, it becomes absolutely false. Hmm? And if we say also that Atman is destructible, then it goes against our experience. It doesn't only go against uh, scriptures, but it goes against our experience because we clearly experience that there is uh, that being in us that's always there no matter what happens. So it, it, it cannot be. It cannot be known. If it is known, it will go through that whole cycle. And that's against the Shruti Pramana scriptures. That again, that's against also our direct experience. Now I'm going to read uh, some portions of the Vakya Bhasha 
just because it's very, very beautiful. And then we will, you know, and then I'll also, I'll stop at certain points and then I will, you know, discuss that with you. I'll read it in English, uh, not the Sanskrit because it will be too much, too much time than if I read both. So he says very beautifully that why is it different from the known? Because he says, the one who knows that is the self of all. So it's different from the known because it's the knower, <laughs> right? The, if it's known, it will be perishable, destructible. If it is known, then who's the knower? So it is different from the known because it itself is the knower. And there, is, there are such quotes in the Upanishad. I'll read this one in Sanskrit because it's a very nice quote. Vignataram are kena vijaniyat iticha vaja saneyake. Means by whom can the supreme knower be known? Vignataram are kena vijaniyat. So who can know the knower? So it is that ultimate knower. And so this is Brahman. So now the question is, okay, Brahman is not known, not known. But then why do you say it's beyond the unknown? So is, is Brahman, you know, beyond the unknown? Uh, is Brahman, why do you say that? Why is it beyond the unknown? Isn't Brahman unknown? I thought if Brahman is not known, then Brahman must be unknown. But why are you saying beyond the unknown? So he says here, Brahman cannot be unknown. So it's not known, but it cannot be unknown. Why? Because knowledge is not required for Brahman. <laughs> what? So now here, here's the beautiful part. He says, only that which is unknown requires knowledge. And Brahman is not unknown because Brahman itself is the nature of knowledge. So how can it be unknown? So it says here very nicely in Sanskrit, I'll read in English. Nachaswata eva apeksha, anapeksham eva sintatvat. Means something doesn't need anything from itself for being what it is, right? Brahman cannot be unknown because it's of the nature of knowledge. Why would you, why would you think it has to be, you know, uh, unknown? And so he says, a lamp doesn't need anything else to illumine it. So Brahman is not unknown. And so here, then the, this, this uh, Purva Paksha, what he calls says, now you're very, very confusing. You're saying Brahman is not known, but you're saying Brahman is not unknown. Then what is the point of all of this? <laughs> what is the point of all of this? So uh, what, is, what is it in Vedanta? You know, because when you say Brahman is, you know, not known, but Brahman is not unknown. So what is it? Brahman is not known. Brahman is that very nature of knowledge itself. And it appears unknown. That's all that's happening. Brahman appears unknown. And therefore, we have to put forth effort to know. This is what it means. So Brahman is not known, but appears unknown. And how does this knowledge work? So iti shushruma purvesham yenastad vyacha chakshire. How is this knowledge really passed on to us? So this is how this knowledge works, okay? Uh, and we had talked about this before about Vritti, Vyapti, and Bhala Vyapti. And I'll just go through that. Then I'll go through another example and then we can get a better understanding of what this means. When we know any object, we said earlier that it needs Vritti, Vyapti. It needs the pervasion of thought uh, in that object. Then that object is known or experienced. Object is known or experienced. But that's not the only step. The next step is what we call Bhala Vyapti, where it is illumined by consciousness. Uh, it's illumined by consciousness. 
or we, what we say, phala here means chidabasa, the reflection of consciousness rather. So it is illumined by the reflection of consciousness. So phala means chidabhyasa, chidabhasa, and vyapti means pervasion, pervasion of that reflection of consciousness. That's how we're able to know anything. Now for the self, what is required, all that's required to know the self, <laughs> I'm doing this, uh, the self has ever known, all that's required to uncover, discover the self is vritti vyapti. All that's required is the thought of knowledge to remove the thought of ignorance. So let's say in a room under the blanket, there is a book under the blanket. So what do we need to do? First step, remove the blanket. That's called vritti vyapti. Remove the blanket and so let the thought pervade the book and let the reflection of consciousness illumine it. And then we get the experience, I know the book or I experience the book. But in the case of the self, what happens is it's like a lamp underneath a blanket, a huh? electric lamp underneath the blanket. All we need to do is remove the blanket, but we don't need anything to illumine that lamp because it's already self-luminous. So it needs a vritti vyapti, but it doesn't need a phala vyapti. So what's required here is we just need that thought that I am that self. That much is enough to remove the ignorance. And then the self remains as itself. So we need only that much. And that's all the mind can access. That's all the intellect can access. More than that, it cannot access. So now I'll give you another example. To just to make this a little bit clearer. Uh, in Vedanta, we have this pot space and total space example, and we understand this clearly. Pot represents what? Pot represents the body and the mind intellect. Space represents that sakshi, sakshi, that uh, witness consciousness, what we call atma, witness consciousness, etc. And that uh, total space is what we call Brahma, Brahman. So what is required? What is required is to know we are total space. That is, that's what's required, right? So what's required, we say, okay, I am not the pot. Means I am not the body, mind, intellect. But I am also not really just the pot space. I'm also not just the pot space. So first we do this negation. So I am not the pot, body, mind, intellect, and I'm not also just the pot space, that Sakshi, but I am really that total space, that Brahman. That's called knowledge. That's called thought of knowledge. And that's called Vritti Vyapti. Now, after that happens, I am Brahman, then there is just silence. There is just being. And that is what we call knowledge. They, 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 you don't need anything else. That is what we call knowledge. That thought that I am not the pot, I am not the pot space, I am that total space, that thought of knowledge removes the thought of ignorance. And that, that much is done. That much knowledge can do. And after that, that's that. there's just that being. There's just that self. Once that thought of knowledge, that, that thought of knowledge also drops, also merges in the self. That thought of knowledge doesn't have to keep staying there. It doesn't have to keep staying there. So the thought of knowledge comes to a certain extent and then that also drops. Hmm? Because, because what is Atman? Atman is that which illumines both the thought of knowledge and the thought of ignorance. Hmm? So this is another, this is now another meaning of anyad eva tad viditat and ato aviditat adi. That which is known is knowledge. That which is known is knowledge. That which is unknown is ignorance, right? So I know something. I don't know something. I know the self. I don't know the self. 
Even these two thoughts of knowledge and ignorance, both of them are illumined by the self. So the self is other than knowledge, self is other than ignorance. Which again goes back to the point that we spoke about last time, or in a few talks in Panchalashi, that where is bondage and liberation? In the mind. That's where it is. It's not in the self. There's no atma that's bound. And there's no atma that needs to be free. Anyad eva tad vidhat. That which is different from the known, but other than the unknown, beyond the unknown. Okay? So what was the first meaning? Means atma cannot be known. If it's known, it's perishable. But atma also is beyond unknown. Why? Because atma is self-effulgent. It's always there. But it appears unknown. Then atma is beyond known, beyond knowledge, but uh, other than known, other than knowledge, but beyond unknown, beyond ignorance. Now one more meaning we will see, and then I think I will stop. <laughs> okay, one more meaning we will see. It says that atma is aheya anupadeya. Okay, heya means something that has to be dropped. Aheya is something that cannot be dropped. Upadeya. Upadeya means something to be taken on. Anupadeya, something that cannot be taken on. Now, in this example that I gave you, when we have something known, right? When something is known, experienced, it is inert. When it is inert, it's perishable. And when it is perishable, then what happens? It's false. And something that's false, it's perishable. What is it? It causes us sorrow. Whenever there's something impermanent, something we find out is false, that causes us sorrow. And whenever something causes us sorrow, we want to, um, we want to drop it. Huh? When something causes us sorrow, we want to drop it, right? So that which is known means we want to let go of it and drop it at the end of the day because it's going to cause us sorrow. It is true. Any drishyam, anything experienced will cause us sorrow. So that which is known, we want to drop. That which is unknown, we want to take up because if it's something that we don't know, we want to know. What, you know, I, I, have you heard about this book or have you heard about this show or this movie? Oh, I don't know. Why don't I know it? Let me see what it is. Let me find out. And we want to take it up. So we want to take it up. And so this known, we want to drop. Unknown, we want to take it up and find out what it is. But Atma is something that we cannot drop. The self is not something we can let go of. Even if we uh, try to let go of Atma, we cannot. We cannot let go of Atma. We cannot let go of Atma. We cannot drop Atma. But at the same time, Atma is not something we can take up. <laughs> we cannot take up anything, you know, anything to be Atma. We cannot add anything to ourselves. Huh? Atma is something that cannot be dropped. It cannot be taken up. It cannot be at some point in time, I will become Atma. I will put Atma in me. No, it's not something that can be taken up. So that which is different from the known and beyond the unknown means that which ca it cannot be dropped, it cannot be taken up. And that's the self. So anything that we can drop is not the self. Anything that we can take up is not the self. Now, if we just meditate on this, that's enough. Anything that we can drop, we can drop material things. We can, our you know, intelligence may drop, our uh, clarity of vision of thinking may drop, our qualities may drop, our moods of the mind may drop, uh, all of our capacities may drop. 
Is that Atma? No. At the same time, things can be taken up. We can make ourselves better. We can work out. We can be healthier. We can sharpen our minds. We can do all of that stuff. Does that change Atma, affect Atma? No. Nothing can make Atma grow and nothing can make Atma shrink. It's a very, very beautiful statement uh, in Sanskrit. One of the mantras, that mantra is not coming to me in Sanskrit, but in English, it, that's what it means. It's not something that can grow, but uh, it's not something that can shrink. It's not something that can be dropped. It's not something that can be taken up. So, Anya Deva, Tad Viditat, Atho Aviditat Adhi. That is the self. Other than the known, beyond the unknown. And how is this known? <laughs> how do we know that it is other than the known and beyond the known? How do we know this? Iti. Shushruma, iti shushruma, we have heard Purvesham from our ancestors. And they, ye, tad vyacha chakshire, they have taught this to us. So this knowledge is not something that we can gain pratyaksha by our senses, by our uh, sight, uh, hearing, smell, taste. Touch pratyaksha means this uh, sensory perception. We cannot gain it by that. At the same time, we cannot gain it by anumana, uh, inference and logic and comparison and all of that, because all of that is dependent on sensory perception. Inference is based on sensory perception. Comparison is based on that. Your cause and effect is based on that. It is based on something that I have already seen. But this knowledge is gained through what we call Shastra Pramana. It's gained through our scriptures. And that scripture through a teacher, which has passed down, been passed down from generation to generation, that is a way that this knowledge can be gained. Hmm? All right. So I will just summarize in a few bits and then um, I'll, I'll pause for any questions for, about this topic. So what we saw today is um, uh, the student asked this question, by what does everything function? The mind, the sense of sight, hearing, smell, taste, touch, by what does everything function? And so the teacher wanted to give the student an insight and tell the student to go more inward, inward, inward. So the eye of the eye, the ear of the ear, the breath of the breath, etc. But now the student is wondering, but how again do I get there? How again do I get there? And so the teacher said, wait, a student saying, well, can I see it? Nope. Nope. Can I speak? Can you speak about it? No, nava gachati. No, manaha. Can I think about it? No, you can't think about it. <laughs> and we also don't know how to tell it to you. We don't know how to teach it to you because we cannot make you realize it. You have to re realize it yourself. And the only thing that we can tell you is the only speech we can use to tell you is that it is beyond speech. It is different from the known and beyond the unknown. And this is the way we have learned from our gurus of the past. And this is the only way that we are showing you. So this is what this means. All right, I'm gonna pause here and uh, just see if anybody has any questions.